appreciate to introduce Julio Gavila, who's my colleague from the Development Planning Unit. Uh, he is, of course, Professor of Urban Policy and International Development here at UCL and the Director of the EU. He's done uh, work on three continents, on urbanization, on health, on public transport, and on water. We we're extremely lucky to have him here today to talk about prosperity in a rapidly urbanizing world and where we go from here. So, thank you very much, Henrietta. Thanks, and, and thank you for jo to join me as well for helping with the logistics. Um, <clears throat> my colleagues have heard bits of this, if not the whole thing. Uh, so apologies to, to those uh, of the degree who are here and in the studio to heard me. But essentially, uh, this is reflections of, of several years of work, uh, and particularly more recent research that I've been doing um, on in Colombia. But it's it's. It's trying to, to rise up to the challenge of Henrietta's of dealing with the issue of prosperity. So I'm not going to get into a, a definition. I will assume that by prosperity I mean development in the broader sense. But she already, we already heard her give a masterful discourse, discourse on, on what prosperity meant for her. So I'm assuming that we're talking about progress, human development, uh, and, and other elements. And I hope the... the uh, the technology works. Um, what we do at DPU and what I, I spent most of my professional life doing is looking at cities, looking at cities that grow rapidly. And most of these cities that grow rapidly in the last few decades are based in the global south, the, you know, formerly called third world or different options. Um, what is clear now is that we now have, are facing a situation where the world is largely urban. Regardless of what definition you use, there are all sorts of um, statistical uh, debates about whether, you know, how you define urban. Let's assume that the world is urban now. In other words, most people are living in cities uh, and uh, will continue to do so in, in different ways. Now, um, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion about why people migrate to cities. A lot of the a crucial component of the growth of cities, of course, is people moving from places that are classified as non-urban rural to cities. Uh, and there's a lot of literature, particularly in the 60s and 70s in Latin America, it, it grew very fast, uh, talking about push and pull factors, factors that pushed you out of your uh, rural environment and factors that pulled you and attracted you to cities. Yeah, and there were all sorts of literature around that, both uh, academic and, and fiction literature on that. It's also associated in many minds, uh, and, and the legacy of that is still present, with modernization theory, the idea that you move in discrete stages from uh, a low productivity, rural, uh, agriculture-based society to a high productivity, urban, industrial-based and service-based society. Now, that has been challenged, uh, and there's, there's a lot of discussion in the literature that some of you may be familiar with. There's no point in discussing it here. But the, the elements of that modernization theory still pervade in people's minds, uh, policymakers and, and the, the public at large. From the point of view of development economics, the economists have tried uh, to model this process and have explained essentially that there is a differential productivity in rural areas and in urban areas which is reflected in differential wages. So it's the difference in wages that attract people from rural to urban areas. Um, this is, uh, so Lewis Fay Rainey's models and the Torado models are variations of that. They also include the variables of unemployment and so on. Structural interpretations, of course, dating back to Marx and another post-Marxian uh, uh, authors have a slightly different table of, of very different take on it, and they talk about imbalances in, in, in society and capitalist sectors attracting sort of high productivity growth and, and accumulation uh, at the expense of, of, of um, the proletariat, essentially, the working classes. Now, what is true is, <coughs> is that urbanization is, is correlated very strongly with increases in income per person. And in people's minds, when you see rapid urbanization, when, when the media portray cities in third world or global south, they tend to focus on, on horror stories of, around slums. 
uh, and, and they tend to convey the image, which has been challenged by uh, you know, specialists in, in, in this, uh, in my field, my colleagues here, much better than me, uh, are saying, well, actually, yes, there are slums, uh, and there is poverty, but all in all, we can associate urbanization with an increase in income per person. And this is where the technology would probably beat me. Uh, and that's what I was getting my, uh, my colleague. Ah, there it is. Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is a piece of technology that, or, or software that many of you would be familiar with. is the Gapminder uh, software developed by Hans Rosling in, in Sweden and, and his colleagues. And essentially what I need to do is go back to... So what you have is on the, on the y-axis, you have urban population. Uh, and right here, you have urban population as a percentage of the total population. And right here, you have income per person in a logarithmic scale, so adjusted for, for inflation. And each one of these blobs represents a country. So big blobs like uh, the, red one, the red ones are in, in Asia, uh, uh, Far East, uh, the, the blue ones are in South Asia, so India is there, and you've got the United States there, and, and uh, Argentina there, and so on. So if I run, so what you see is countries that are at the beginning of the period for which there is data, 1960, there is no data, historical data on this, unfortunately, or at least not that um, Rosling has used. What you can see very clearly is that there's a, a large number of countries, particularly the very large ones and poor countries, are bunched up on the left-hand corner, which means they're low uh, income per capita, but also low uh, ur uh, share of the urban population. Whereas rich countries, in this case, the US, uh, Germany, and so on, are on the top right-hand corner. But see what happens when, when you run it from 1960 to 2010, uh, in slow motion, and it's uh, what you see is, is China is coming up here, India is catching up very much. You've got the U.S. is sort of very slowly uh, increasing its urbanization, uh, its, its rate of urbanization, but not a lot. But what you see is from the beginning, where China and India were around here, they're now growing very fast, and China right now in 2010 is about half urban, regardless of how you you look at that. Now, there's another correlation which is quite interesting. So, in other words, as countries urbanize, there is a correlation with increased per capita income. Another interesting correlation is with life expectancy. So, what you've got is a um, similar picture here. Again, you've got the large countries there. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to just check a couple of ones. So, life expectancy is low in the poor countries and low urbanized countries. But see what happens when, when they start uh, urbanizing. There is a move towards uh, a rapid increase towards the uh, top hand corner. I don't know if you noticed this movement here of two countries, which is quite interesting in the figure. Um, so this one, which is an outlier, that's Rwanda at the time of genocide. So life expectancy clearly dropped dramatically. Uh, and then the, before that, there's Cambodia as well which is that one, which also dropped dramatically in the, in the 1960s, 70s. Uh, so, so there is clearly a correlation between those two. The final one, which has to do with, um, uh, with human uh, development index, is child mortality. Again, countries that are low urbanized or have low degrees of, of shares of urbanization tend to have high degrees of, of child mortality, high numbers of high mortality. You know, very high, and this in the case of India, 166. In the case of Bangladesh, 198 per 1,000 uh, at born, and China, 61. See what happens when, sorry, that was 1980. It wasn't meant to be. But it's even lower when you look at these. So see what happens when, we, when, when they start urbanizing. Cre clearly, they start not only growing, but very fast, the, the number of, of kids that are die uh, fall dramatically as a percentage of the population. Now, the final little play, uh, game that I'm going to play is in something that, okay, so, which is the question that I posed in the title. What do we do? What, where do we go from here? Or what do we do about this? Now, what, what is actually shocking is if you look at tax revenues uh, and, and correlate it with urbanization levels. So we've seen very clearly 
that as countries urbanize, they become richer, the uh, survival rate is higher, and generally all the human development indicators improve. But see what happens with tax. So what we have is very few countries for which there is data in 1960. So you, know, you would see new uh, data being ap appearing on, on the screen. Uh, I'm just going to play it a little slower. Again, China here, and so on. So what you have is, is percentage of tax revenue, as, uh, sorry, tax revenue as a percentage of GDP. There are some funny outliers, like the Soto, I have no idea why. Uh, but then, then you've got Brazil here, which is 12% of, of income uh, of GDP is from tax. See what happens when, when you play this. They barely move out of the 30%, except for a few outliers. outliers. So, so they become more urbanized, but the tax revenue doesn't go up, which is very interesting because at the same time as they're urbanizing, they're becoming wealthier. There is no money around. Uh, and so that poses an interesting, interesting question, um, which is that um, if you compare that with the fact that as cities grow and countries urbanize, the degree of inequality and fragmentation within cities increases dramatically. And you can see it uh, also in, in quite interesting, this, this um, report that appeared this week, or last week, earlier this week, I think, by Oxfam for the Davos meeting, which is showing, and it's all over the press this week, of course, which shows how an increasing uh, wealth, share of, of global wealth is concentrated more and more in the bottom 1% or, oh, sorry, in the top 1%. So if you look at these figures, essentially what they show as a share of global wealth, it started as 48 for the top 1% and 52 for the top, for the bottom 99%. They diverged, so in other words, there was a, a, an increase in, in um, distribution of income, improved distribution of income, and is now converging again. And what they've said is that in a few years' time, maybe two, three years' time, if things continue as they are, the top 1% will own half of the world's wealth. Now, that is mirrored to some extent, although perhaps in not so much uh, uh, so acutely, at the national level. So countries are converging in terms of wealth, but within countries, wealth is diverging. So more and more, uh, a, a few and fewer people uh, have a, a bigger... Um, share of the, of the cake. Now, this is um, reflected in cities, of course, because you know, as people and countries urbanize, they live more in cities, and you see examples like this. I mean, I, I've shown this picture to people and say, what do you think this is? Assuming they can't read this. I mean, I don't think anybody can read it. And they say, well, it's probably Sub-Saharan Africa, East Africa. It's Aguas Lindas, in, outside Brasilia. Brasilia is the richest city in, 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 or the most expensive city in Brazil. It's a capital city, of course, built in the 1950s. And it's a city that is UNESCO protected, the, the urban plan is protected, and so on. But it's extremely expensive to live there. So the cleaners, the taxi drivers, the bus drivers, uh, the, the basic uh, service people cannot afford to live in Brasilia. Where do they live? They live in, in neighbor, neighboring townships. They, they almost look like South African townships, like our West Indies. And, and, and you will see that this is repeated in other countries. Uh, this is Northeast Bogota, where I was born. Uh, you see a wealthy part of the town, Northeast, relatively leafy, not hugely leafy, but, and then you see where uh, a, a sort of a, what we call a pirate subdivision, an illegal subdivision that developed in the 1970s and is now consolidated, where a largely working class population lives opposite sides of the spectrum. So they're, they're living in the same city. You also have this. Now you go out a little bit more to different parts, to opposite sides of the city, and what do you see? You see on the left-hand side a place called Pradera de Potosí, which is an exclusive golf club and, uh, and, and, and uh, gated community. And you can see the houses there at the bottom. This is the clubhouse, where a very few proportion of people live. Uh, tiny, tiny numbers of, of very wealthy people live. And you go to the extreme of the city outside Bogota in a neighboring municipality, 
which is where the large concentration of, of population live, a large concentration of working class population live, and this is what you see. So it's a shocking contract within the same city. So it's, it's a reflection of that, of that fragmentation that I was talking about earlier. Um, but this is not restricted to Latin America. It's also happening in Sub-Saharan Africa and it's happening in Asia. And this is an example of uh, work that we've done with some colleagues uh, on, on urban zoonotic diseases in, in Nairobi. Here on the left, this is a, a low-income settlement called Vivandani, an informal settlement. And this is what the elites are building out for themselves, uh, Tatu Estates, which is now under construction, several billion dollars worth of construction. Uh, so, so what can city governments do about, about it? Uh, this is something that I've been working on for a while, uh, which is, yes, at the national level, you can actually use taxation to try and redress these imbalances. Just with, I don't think... Well, if you look at places like Brazil, uh, to some extent Ecuador and Venezuela, although that's disputed because the statistics are terrible, uh, you could argue that the income disparities at a national level have, have de can be decreased through, through special social programs. But what can local governments do? What can city governments do? Which is what, something that I've been working on for many, many years, particularly around issues of infrastructure. When you look at something like this, this is, a, this is the role of the local government, to collect rubbish, to clean the streets, to build sewers and manage them. This is what local governments do, but often they, they're unable to do it. They don't have the people, they don't have the staff, the, 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 the engineers, they don't have the resources, financial and otherwise. Uh, so people make do. They just get access to infrastructure, they just plug into the, to the network system illegally, uh, as in uh, this case of, um, in, in Cape Town. Uh, often private firms, and, and by private firms I don't mean sort of the, the, the large, you know, the Suez and large companies like that, but small companies actually, informal companies like this one, provide a basic service which is sanitation in a, in a very dense uh, informal settlement in, in Accra in Ghana. Uh, and this is in the background uh, in the context in which cities around the global south have an enormous proportion of the population, ranging from anything from 40 to 80 percent uh, in living in what we call informal settlements. Uh, they have different names in different places, but it's essentially places that do not uh, adhere to the planning norms. Uh, and we can talk about that. So this is, uh, so the yellow bits are, are Bogota, is this 60% of the population, although 20%, 25% of the area, because they're much denser than the rest of the city. And this is the case of Medellin. Also, again, the yellow bits are the ones that, that are informal in Medellin, which is the second largest city in Colombia. So, so what I want to finish with is, is just to uh, share my experience of, of working on Colombia's second largest city, Medellin, which uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of publications around it. We, we published a book about this research. And it's actually what our interest, interest was, can cities like Medellin, which is, has the highest Gini coefficient in Colombia, in other words, the highest income disparity between the rich and the poor, can it dis do something about it? And we discovered they can within certain conditions. Um, so this is the, you can see, sort of, this is all informal settlements with a few formal settlement, formal uh, buildings on the left. Uh, so it's a vast expanse of a very complex topography. And this is the sort of things that they've done with the city. They've, I don't have time to go into the, the financial model in which, with which they managed to raise the funds to do these sort of things, but it's an interesting example to follow in many ways, and that's why we keep talking about it. I mean, it, it's not perfect by any means, but it's an example uh, in some ways. So they moved, for example, from an informal settlement like this, which was washed down every time it rained really, and it's tropical, to, to this where they relocated people who were along the, the stream on, on sort of five-story buildings with, without a lift, but they left them there. They didn't break the, the social fabric, which is crucial. And this is what governments always do. They just kick people out replay, move them somewhere else, evict them somewhere else. They don't care about keeping the social fabric intact. And this is crucial for their survival and their well-being, mental and, and physical. They also upgraded spaces and they created these cable cars that we've, we've done sort of is the object of our, of our research. It's the main 
subject of research. And finally, in areas which, and I must say, Berlin is not only the second city, largest city in Colombia, but when all these things were done in the uh, late 90s, uh, 2000s, it was one of the most violent cities in the world with a high homicide rate linked to the drugs business, illegal drugs business. Uh, and these are areas that still today have you know, high homicide rates, but much, much lower than they used to be. And, and what is interesting is, is by just investing in infrastructure and just working in a participatory manner with the populations. And I, again, I don't have time to, to, exp to, to expand on that, but maybe at question time we can do that. Um, they have managed to really improve people's lives. So there is hope for local governments to do that, but as long as the taxation is there. So remember my other graph, or, or Rosling's graph, about taxation not going up. We have to do something about taxation because that's the only way in which national government, but also local governments, can actually do these kind of things to try and address those imbalances. Thank you. suburbs around London. Mm. Uh, Virginia Water, for example. Yes. I, I, uh, Virginia Water stuck in my mind because Pinochet spent, spent a, few, oh, okay. a few months uh, there as, as yes. Mrs. Thatcher's um, yes. guest. Yes. Uh, but it's one of the richest parts uh, yeah. of the UK. Mm. I, know. I mean, you need a high level of income to live in an area which is leafy, low density, mm. and yet you have an urban lifestyle. Yeah. You, know, you, you probably commute or telecommute yeah. and work from there. Mm. You take the train, go to the city mm. or wherever it is. Uh, and, and, and cities are wonderful when, when they can do that, mm -hmm. but of course there is that fragmentation just increases. And yeah. this is what the elites in, in, in these large cities that I've been talking about are trying to emulate to mm -hmm. some extent, mm -hmm. it, is to recreate that sort of low, low, uh, low density environment. Uh, and that's because cities at some point, if you look at Bogotá, you look at Mexico City and so on, they, they start losing their economies of scale yep. and they become more chaotic, more difficult to manage, uh, and, and less productive. The productivity yeah. decreases. In fact, we have an expert in that subject here, in, in, the, in the form of Najee, my colleague. <laughs> uh, but they, they, they do decrease uh, dramatically, uh, and the inefficiencies are. I, I yeah. could see it with Bogotá. I've been yeah. studying Bogotá for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the 19, nine, late 1990s, early 2000s, when the reforms were introduced by Mayor Peñalosa, which mm -hmm. was, you know, fantastic public transport system around the bus rapid transit system, cycle routes and so on. It was easy to do these uh, these changes mm -hmm. because the city wasn't growing very fast in population terms mm -hmm. or in economic terms. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of money from previous mm -hmm. mayors mm -hmm. and, and he could do these, these fantastic things. Now it's a much more difficult city to manage. Mm -hmm. Wealth has increased, people have been able to buy cars mm -hmm. and, and the public transport has not really kept up with it. So cities at some point we we'll start, and uh, there's an anecdotal evidence in Mexico, for example, that mm -hmm. people are now moving out of Mexico City because they, they feel this, this enormous thing is not for them, mm -hmm. uh, professionals, and they're moving to, to cities which are within relatively short commuting time, mm -hmm. but much smaller and much more manageable when they raise their, their, their families. Yeah. In some cases, you know, the, the breadwinner, the breadwinners mm -hmm. 
commute to Mexico because uh, you know it's, it's cheaper to live in these cities. But so there may be uh, you know this is a phenomenon which, which is a regional phenomenon in the sense that cities have become very very large cities if they're not properly managed have become very inefficient or, or are tending to become inefficient. The case of Medellin is different because it's it's three and a half million. It's it's still manageable uh, and it has a number of sort of like anthropological sociological yeah. conditions which allow it to be managed still as a as a as one whole. Uh, but the trouble with very large cities is that they become very, very unwieldy. I don't know what that response to your question. I want to ask a very similar question about social capital uh, that seems to be at the heart of this dilemma. You know, uh, fast change, then uh, growing population, uh, and you know the difficulty with taxes, right? So if, if, if you get greater diversity, growth change, then social capital would go down, and that in turn would make it more difficult to raise taxes. In, in the sense, social capital would seem to be possibly one key issue. But how do you how do you create more social capital? Do you have there is, a, there is a wonderful example that people quote endlessly, uh, which is again Bogotá. I'm sorry to go back to Bogotá. You know, this is a city uh, after the year that I know best uh, because I've studied it for a long time. Uh, there, there was a mayor in, in, the, in the 1990s, uh, and then again the second uh, and, and then in the, 90, in the 2000s called uh, Thanos Mok. Thanos Mok was, was a, is a philosopher, a very interesting man, and he's actually given talks here. Uh, and he, what he did was to look at essentially a social, he never called it social capital, he looked at social capital in the city and say, um, essentially what people need to do is learn to live with each other. This is, we come from a very traumatic process of migration, uh, deracination, violence in the case of Colombia, the you know, civil war in the 1950s, uh, late 40s and 50s. Uh, and that sort of deracinated the created chaos people's minds. So you need, and, and they don't know how to live in cities. This was his, his premise. Because they're, 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 uh, the parents were not born in the cities and there's, there's, well, there's no sense of, of ownership or, or belonging. And he sets about by to, to rebuild that or build that sort of sense of social capital and say to people, look, what we need, what you need is tolerance. You need to learn to live together. You need to, to respect pedestrians if you're driving. You need to respect each other. Do not kill each other. Just talk through things. Uh, there was a tendency, and there's a tendency in Colombia to sort of, if you have a dispute, you just act uh, with violence as opposed to with the word. And he actually managed to change in the most dramatic way. There are countless PhD dissertations and books written about this. I'm not saying anything they do. He, he actually managed to change people's behavior. Not only that, but in terms of tax, to respond to your question, what he did as well was to say to, to having built this sense that yes, we are here, we're all together in this, we all need to work towards a common purpose. Uh, he said uh, he increased taxes and said, well, here's a tax uh, which was linked to pro uh, property values, um, to cadastral um, values. If you want to pay 10% extra, we will give you a price. And an enormous number of people paid extra, above, well above what they were meant to pay, which is the, the most amazing test of, of that, of that uh, hypothesis he had, that you know, once you build the idea that you can tolerate that we're living here in society, there's no going back, that we, we have to uh, respect others, then it's an amazing step. And again, that's well documented. The mayor really doesn't quite act. Yes. Yeah. Trouble is that again, because he's a very charismatic figure, uh, very puzzling in many ways, but very colorful. Um, it's only he who could do that. And that's the danger of some democracies where you know an elected uh, person can actually embody so much charisma uh, and so much power, but then when that person is not there, then you know, unless you have institutions that can continue that work, uh, things crumble. And that's what happened afterwards. So a lot of that solidarity is lost. And as I said, you know, it's a much more unwieldy city to, to manage because the traffic has increased several fold, uh, congestion has increased several fold, and so on. Thank you. Yeah,
briefly mention how this city is managing the financial resources? Um, it's largely cadastral. Um, well, actually, there are two, two ways. Uh, one is property, property uh, tax. Uh, pro property tax. And, and the crucial element to do, which is what you don't see in many sub Saharan African cities, poor cities, is that there's no cadastral survey that is up to date and accurate that you can use as a basis to tax property. What these cities have done is, first thing is they did, they did a, a, an updated cadastral property system. They introduced that tax over, oh, it's been there all along, but they, they, they were able to, to uh, modernize it and, and update it. The second thing, um, the second major source of, of income for the city for this kind of projects comes from a very interesting scheme, which is in many ways what attracted me to Medellin. Uh, so several things that attracted me to Medellin, but that particular model attracted me enormously, which is that the city has refused to privatize its public utility system. Whereas the World Bank, the IMF, the donors have always said, Governments are hopeless at running utility companies, you know, water and sanitation, electricity, telecommunications, uh, uh, energy, and so on. Forget it. They're useless. They can't. It's, it's, it's a dogma. It's a dogma from the date back to the early uh, 70s, from neoclassical economics. It's a very strong ideological position. And they've said, no, we're not going to do it for other reasons, a complex set of reasons that I don't have time to explain. Uh, and what they've done instead is to build a major utility company, which is effectively a multinational company, which is worth uh, well over $10 billion in assets. It's owned by the municipality entirely, and all the profits, I call them surplus, not profits, all the surplus are reinvested in the municipality. And what they do is they generate energy, for example, uh, 24% of the energy in Colombia they generate. There's a law that forbids anybody, any company, single company, from generating more than 25%. So they're stuck at 24%. And then they went and bought generating companies in other countries. Uh, they also provide uh, utility services, they run water supply systems, they run uh, uh, energy distribution systems, and so on for other cities and make money out of that. So all that money is a very hugely profitable company gets reinvested in the form of these kind of projects. But it's a very unusual model. And when I was doing up my research, uh, I realized, I asked the, the then head of the company, uh, why you guys are black box? Why does anybody know about you? I mean, uh, everybody knows about the wonderful things they do, but they haven't actually allowed anybody to see how they write, really operate. Because it's, again, from the performances I do, it's fascinating. It's, it's the elite keeping it very close to their chest. And they said, well, don't worry. The World Bank have just uh, sent two people here to spend two months with us studying what we do when we produce a case study. Because it's, it's, even the World Bank regards this as a, as a fantastic example of, of how you can run a city without privatizing. So thankfully, the World Bank has recognized that not everything has to be privatized. Okay. Yeah. Great presentation, Julia. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. One. A comparison of the in-country compared to global economy drivers for organization and the sustainability of that organization, not least uh, because of um, thoughts generated by what we hear from China about the difficulty of the massive, massive cities that have grown there uh, su surviving in a period of economic downturn when the massive populations that have come into their cities are probably not necessary anymore. Um, so, and then the subsidiary question about how people from the countryside maintain a foothold back in the countryside. They don't become fully deracinated, but they have the option of going back to their, their family, uh, their native origins. Mm. Very interesting question, very complex question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in terms of the first one, I think once you've urbanized, it's very hard to send people back. Uh, to the countryside, because they're, they're, you know what they're looking for not, is not necessarily only higher incomes as the, the economic models predict. They're also looking for other things. They're looking for greater opportunities in terms of education for the kids, in terms of access to health, uh, in terms of, of, of um, you know consumer goods. Why not? Uh, uh, and, and even at the expense sometimes of losing that linkage with the rural areas and, and a, you know, a social capital that they, they have when they left. But the other dimension is that 
an enormous proportion of the population that move to cities do not move straight from rural areas. Yeah. Yeah, certainly in Latin America, they move they move from smaller cities. So they already had, a, if you like, a, some degree of urban lifestyle. Uh, but the other dimension of, of urban growth that is important to realize is that natural growth, in other words, people just having children in the city, accounts for a much higher proportion these days than migration in terms of growth. Uh, so there are three components to urban growth. One is uh, natural growth. The other one is migration, which is how people feel, of, you know, the, the general public tends to see cities growing. They forget that there's, there's, there's other two. And the third one, which is not unimportant, in some cases probably dramatically important, is reclassification of city boundaries. So as cities start growing and there are cities around it or municipalities around it, in, in one go you can increase by 30% of your population just overnight. And, and these things have to be moderated against each other. So, so migration is not the main component of people's physics. In China it is now, of course it is. It has been for the last 20 years, you know, because it, it's moved again, as the economists predicted, from low productivity, rural-based uh, farm economy to cities which are high productivity, industrial-based, manufacturing-based. What happens once they're there? Well, I mean, it's a big challenge. Uh, and what happened in, in Latin America was that the fact that the, uh, rural areas could not sustain people, that there was in some cases violence in rural areas, that there were no services, meant that people had to move to urban areas. Uh, and, but they had to move to urban areas which were not the ideal urban areas that they had seen in TV. There was TV then, which in many cases there wasn't in the 60s. Uh, but they had to live, it, it make do with whatever was there, and then, hence the informal subdivisions. Uh, but, as Daniel, who's there, who's working with me on his PhD in, 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 southern, in this area, or southern Bogotá, will tell you, the, the level of consolidation in these areas, people start investing in, their, in a piece of land, and a, in, a, in, a, in a construction, in a, a piece of housing, that becomes then their main asset. Uh, and, and that's an asset that they can sort of keep for themselves, but also give to their, to their children, particularly in the absence of uh, a social security system and a pension system, which is the case in many, many countries. Now, Latin America, particularly middle-income and higher-income countries in Latin America, do have pension systems which cover a large proportion. In terms of keeping links with the, with the rural uh, area, uh, that's completely gone in Latin America. Completely gone. As there's no... I mean, it's, a migration is far, too far in the past. Uh, we're talking about 1960s and 70s. Uh, but you do see that in, and I see it, and anthropologists have documented this, I'm not sure I'm not much more than me about this, but there is, there is that linkage in people's imagination in Sub-Saharan Africa, very, very strongly. And, you know, whenever I go to Sub-Saharan Africa and talk to people about, uh, about, you know, where home is and where do you want, they always refer to their village. And they always say, I'm going to die in my village. I'm going to retire in my village, and I want to die in my village. I, I don't think anybody's done it. To be honest, I think you know maybe a tiny proportion of people have actually uh, you know, fulfilled that wish. Uh, maybe it's too early to say because that population hasn't yet retired in investment. In but it's a much more difficult process to do. Hey, Julio, a question: Is something that bears in relation to uh, tax revenues and local investments <coughs> by local governments? And is in, in the case of Medellin, you said that this come partly from uh, a property value and, and yeah. tax collection from property. But what happens when there is a context of decentralization and the people, these poor people that are, are moving towards the urban areas go to adjacent municipalities outside of the jurisdiction of, let's say, the big city that is in the capacity for collecting, mostly in, in conditions of informality and poverty, which, allow, which doesn't allow tax collection to be small enough to get enough resources for this local investment. So, yeah. Yeah. what what can be done in this way when we have our local governments that are in no capacity to conduct these these investments and these trainings? Uh, this is a question for his for his PhD. I'm sure he's writing the right chapter now. Yeah. <laughs> he knows the answer already. He knows so well. Uh, <laughs> uh, oops. What did I do with it? Yeah. What what what? Uh, 
what I think Daniel has in mind is that uh, he's working in this part of, of Bogota. So this is just outside the boundary of Bogota in this area. So the picture, I sh one of the pictures I showed earlier of, of enormous deprivation is, is here. I contrasted this uh, with uh, a settlement which is this, this gated community up there in the north. So at exactly opposite sides of the city. That's north. This is, um, th this is um, south uh, west. This is a municipality that, um, just like Brasilia, my argument, and I'd love to do research on this, but I haven't got time, is that uh, a little bit like the, um, the, the structuralist writers in, in, on development in the 60s were saying, uh, Wallerstein and people like that were, were arguing that the rich world was rich because the poor world was poor. So there was this, this uneven development kind of. I think to some extent there's an argument for for using the same framework to look at cities. So that's why I showed the pictures of Brasilia and Agroslinos. Brasilia can be Brasilia because Agroslinos exists. Because this is, Agroslinos allows the Brazilian, the people living in Brasilia, Brasilienses, to, to lead a life that they can lead by hiring very poor paid people uh, that are being in a way subsidized by the awful conditions in our students. So that duality is there, and I've got cases in several cities, and this is one of them. I mean, uh, the large, a large part of the population in Bogota who are working class and very poor live in this area, which is Daniel's research. Uh, and, and the problem is, this is a municipality that doesn't have the capacity to raise taxes. Doesn't have the capacity to raise taxes because it doesn't have the people, yeah. but it, because the people who live there are largely informal and poor. And even if they were to be charged taxes on an environment that is informal, they wouldn't be able to pay. So it's a conundrum. I, I think the, the solution for this is a political one, essentially, that to say, well, Swatcha will now become part of a metropolitan area. Because Bogota, for many decades, was contained just in one, subdiv in one um, administrative area. And then started a, this area started appearing outside of that administrative area. Bogota many lucky, is very lucky in many ways because in 1953, five six municipalities were amalgamated into this vast area, which has allowed it to invest and be managed as a big whole, in contrast with Santiago de Chile, which has 40 municipalities, or comunas, as they call them, or Caracas, which has five. So, so but it's, it's about time now that Bogota has an umbrella uh, administration, which allows this cost to subsidize But of course, there is an enormous uh, there's an enormous uh, reaction uh, against that by the local politicians in, in, in Swatcha, which is the area where he is, or the neighboring municipalities, because they will lose power to the city. I'm very mindful. Yes, I'm going to teach it too. However, I would like to just take these two questions briefly, so one here and one here. So just take them together, actually. Yeah, thank you. Um, fascinating and thought-provoking. I was just interested to hear how you present um, promoting urban prosperity and as the role of the city in government. But my question is really, what, do you, what do your studies of urban areas of Colombia and other parts of the world help you to think about national prosperity? How can we, how can mm -hmm. the development, you know, you know, the healthier development of cities contribute to the well-being of the rural. Of course, understanding there is actually quite a lot of interaction between the two, especially as more and more roads are built and people can afford the one-hour flight, for example, from Vienna to Costco, etc. Um, because if it's just the city government that's taking charge of promoting the prosperity of the city, they're not going to challenge this modernist, urbanist idea that the rural is backward or peasant, indigenous, minority now, sort of non-Western, all the cultural, historic um, negativity towards the Amazon, the Earth, yeah. the Andes, yeah. and the people that inhabit. So how, if we think about sustainable prosperity of a nation, yeah. how can I mean, we... I mean, one, one, one interesting example, you can hear, if anybody is plugging this, I, I have no stake in this, but at, at 515, at the Institute of the Americas, there's a talk by a, a minister, the Minister for Human Talent of Ecuador, who's a very interesting man. I only met him this week. Uh, he's, he's got a PhD from UCLA University. 
and and he is, I presume he will talk about that. What is the Ecuadorian government? But I think in many ways, what what the Correa government has done since uh, the last seven years, when it came out in, in was re-elected, uh, is trying to do a bit of that. Uh, they've created four new universities uh, to counteract the weight of the private university. So they're, what they're doing is bringing back the state and making the state sort of more, more powerful as an actor, as opposed to what Ecuador had for years and years and years, which is either you know landowners, very powerful landowners that manage the country, or NGOs, you know, sort of charity organizations that manage social services. What what Correa's model is saying, which is quite interesting, and I think huge one to work as well, is is the state has to be more powerful. It has to be able to meet the benefits of the government, largely through oil. And he has he has a plan to, to do what you what you're saying. In other words, use that will to plant uh, engines of growth uh, and, and diversification of the economy. For example, in Ikiam, which is a university in the Amazon that they're, they're they're developing with, and we're in UCL helping them. So it's an interesting thing. If anybody wants to be involved in that, that's, they're open for that kind of discussion. Uh, there's a slightly loopy uh, project called Yachai, which is a brand new city. And I don't like brand new cities, I think they're terrible on the planet. They're costly, it's beautiful in a lovely environment, 5,000 hectares. I visited it as a, you know, I was invited to be a, a, sort of a, an advisor to, to it in one, one occasion. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a not a very good way of spending your resources. But it, you can do it. So I think Ecuador is in some ways trying to redress the violence. But I think, it, I don't think the trouble with that, and it's a very complex uh, question, a very complex argument, but Trouble is that is that that may engender uh, an argument for the opposite, which is that cities are stealing the, the wealth of the country, and therefore we shouldn't put money into cities and so on, which is which is a, a you know the opposite side of the argument. Uh, cities are the places that are most productive in in a country. This is where the greatest amount of wealth is generated. I'm talking about just monetary work, I'm not talking about other kinds of work, uh, is generated on a per capita basis. So they have to be there. The, the question is how do you get some of that wealth and distribute it in intelligently, not just spread it very thinly across the country, but intelligently in other parts. And this is, uh, again, that America shows countless models. Sorry. I'm really sorry, we are, uh, next time I'll talk to you, but okay. So can we just thank Julia for wonderful talk?